Uh, thank you all for being here. It's uh, wonderful to be back in the uh, White House briefing room. I have a couple of uh, brief announcements I wanted to make, uh, if you'll bear with me. First, earlier this morning, John Brennan, Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, hosted an Olympic Security Deputies meeting with the full counterterrorism and law enforcement community to take stock of our efforts working with the United Kingdom to prepare for the London 2012 Olympic Games. Following that meeting, Mr. Brennan provided the President with an update on the Olympics as well as the United States government's support uh, to the United Kingdom prior to and during the Games. The President directed that we continue to ensure uh, that we are doing everything possible to keep the American people safe and to continue close cooperation with our British counterparts. In keeping with our special relationship, the President also made cl it clear that he has the utmost confidence in our close friend and ally, the United Kingdom, as they finalize preparations to host uh, the London Olympics. Uh, next, changing subjects, I just wanted to note that, uh, as you saw last night, the Senate took action and passed a bill to extend the middle class tax cuts for 114 million middle class families. The House should follow suit and pass this bill right away. The House Republicans are now the only people left in Washington holding hostage the middle class tax cuts for 98 percent of Americans and 97 percent of small businesses. The fact is the typical middle class family cannot afford a $2,200 tax hike at the beginning of next year. It's time for House Republicans to drop their demand for another one trillion dollar giveaway to the wealthiest Americans and give our families and small businesses the financial security and certainty that they need. As the President said last night, we need tax cuts for working Americans, not for folks who don't need them and weren't even asking for them. Uh, and with that, I will take your questions. Mr. Fell, oh wait, before I do, I think congratulations are in order. I should have said that when I called on you, but I'll do it again. Ben. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. I wanted to try to get some clarity about uh, gun control and president's positions. Um, <clears throat> since the Colorado tragedy, you've been telling us that the president wants to keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people uh, mm -hmm. under existing laws. And then last night, to the Urban League, he said there have been actions taken, but um, they do not go far enough. He talked about AK-47s being kept off of six streets. And so I'm just trying to get clear, does he or, or does he not think that any new gun legislation is well, let me back up a little bit and say that President Obama has called for common sense measures that protect the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens and improve public safety by keeping guns out of the hands of those who should not have them under existing law. And as I think you know, thanks to the administration's efforts, background checks conducted on those looking to purchase firearms are now more thorough and more complete. The Department of Justice uh, can provide more details on that. I would also say that, uh, or note that the President made a broader point last night, uh, which is that tackling the problem of violence is not just about gun laws. In communities across the country, the administration is partnering with local uh, law enforcement and government officials to reduce crime, to connect young people with summer jobs so they spend less time on the street, and to set up programs that steer children away from a life of gang violence and toward the safety and promise of a classroom. We also must recognize that it is not enough to debate the role of government in reducing violence. It is up to parents, teachers, neighbors, and communities to make a difference in the lives of our young people as well. I think that the point the President was making in the speech that he delivered last night was that uh, you know, we have to remember that in the wake of an awful event like the one in Aurora, Colorado, that uh, violence is not an isolated incident. In, in, in America and that we need to uh, take a broader look uh, at it and, and, and try to tackle it from a, a number of different directions, which, which this President has uh, been doing through his administration. I, I get that broader <coughs> point that he was speaking about more than the role of government, and that was sort of part of the coverage, mm -hmm. but I'm still not clear about the answer to my specific question. Does he think any new specific on legislation is needed or is existing, uh, for existing laws uh, what's needed? Well, he believes that we can uh, enhance uh, the enforcement of existing laws uh, by making it more difficult for those who uh, should not have weapons under existing laws, uh, making it more difficult for, uh, for them to obtain weapons. And, and that's what he's, uh, his uh, Department of Justice has been working on. Um, I think you're aware of the fact that there's 
a stalemate in Congress on uh, a broad range of issues, and this would include this one. The assault weapons ban is an issue uh, that the President has uh, supported uh, the uh, reinstatement of uh, since uh, its expiration in 2004. Uh, but uh, given the stalemate in Congress, our fo focus is on the steps that we can take uh, to make sure criminals and others who should not have those guns uh, uh, make sure that they cannot obtain them. Two points. So does he plan to do anything when he talked last night about working with Congress, no stone unturned? Does he plan to do anything <laughs> this year to make another case for that assault weapons ban? Well, I, I'm not going to uh, make uh, scheduling announcements in terms of what the President may or may not say in the future. What I can tell you is that the President's point last night was broader. I think there is an issue about the stalemate in Congress, and there are things that we can do uh, short of legislation. Uh, and short of gun laws, as the President said, uh, that can reduce violence uh, in our society and, 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 as he mentioned last night, in our urban centers. Uh, so, you know, I, I think he, I know he will continue to press the Department of Justice to um, try to enhance the enforcement of existing laws, uh, try to uh, further develop our background check system so that uh, it prevents criminals and those who should not have weapons from getting them under existing law. Uh, and he'll continue to uh, make sure that his administration is partnering with local law enforcement officials and, and, and government officials to uh, try to do the things that I talked about at the top uh, that can help reduce violence. Last one, you focus a lot on background checks. Uh, our reporting shows that the suspect in Aurora passed all of his background checks. Can you explain how even an enhanced background check system would stop something like this? Look, I don't think the President ever suggested that the background check uh, can stop every crime from occurring in America, and even one as heinous as this. I'm not going to get into the specifics of, an, uh, of what happened in Aurora because there's obviously an ongoing investigation. But we do need to take a, a broader look at the, what we can do to reduce violence in America, and it's uh, it requires a multifaceted approach that looks at this problem from a variety of uh, angles, and that's not just legislative and it's not just about gun laws. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, turning to the foreign subject, is Margaret, there any? Right. Margaret. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, is there any official? Is there any reaction from the White House on the indictment of Beaujolais' wife at this time? You know, I'll have to uh, take that question. I do. I was not aware of that. And maybe the State Department has a reaction. Yeah. Uh, Jake. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, just two topics on Syria quickly. I, you know that this crisis is deepening, it's escalating, the ongoing assault in Aleppo. I just want to make sure I'm clear on what is it that the U.S. is doing right now? What can they do besides wait and see if there's some consensus reached to the U.S.? Well, we're, we're continuing to work with uh, uh, other nations and the Friends of Syria as well as other international partners to uh, provide humanitarian assistance to the Syrian people provide uh, assistance to the opposition as it uh, tries to uh, form itself uh, and unify um, non-lethal assistance to the opposition, uh, as well as uh, administrative assistance, if you will, uh, that the Friends of Syria is providing as, as the opposition comes together. Uh, but uh, it is a point uh, that you made that is worth uh, noting that there is an ongoing assault uh, happening in Syria that, that demonstrates once again the depravity of uh, President Assad and his regime. Uh, the fact is they're using uh, artillery and fixed-wing aircraft, or there were reports of that, as well as helicopters, against uh, a civilian population center. Uh, and it once again points to the need for international consensus around the idea that Syria's future cannot include um, President Assad because of the actions that he's taken against his people. And we need to move quickly to uh, look at what, well, Syria can and should be in a post-Assad world, work with our partners, work with the opposition to, to help create that transition, because Assad's uh, days are surely numbered. A as we've seen, it's clear that he's losing control of Syria. Uh, the momentum against the Assad regime continues with defections throughout the government. As we've seen in recent days, increasing numbers of formerly pro-regime Syrians, officials in the government, ambassadors to foreign countries, military personnel, high-ranking milita military personnel 
are recognizing that to stand in solidarity with Assad is to stand against the Syrian people. That's why it's time for the Syrian people and the international community to focus on what comes next, as I said. And then one more on, on, on the guns issue. Uh, <coughs> these are some of the president's strongest words yet on, on this issue. Does he feel like he's shown leadership publicly on, uh, on the issue of guns during his term? Well, the president's feelings about this issue, I think, were reflected in what he said. Uh, and. Uh, those comments and remarks echo what the President has said in the past. And I think he does uh, take a broad view about the, the problem of violence and, and how we need to address it. Uh, he is very mindful of the need when it comes to legislation that we uh, ensure that we protect the Second Amendment rights of uh, law-abiding American citizens. Uh, that is very important to him, and we, he believes that we can take measures that improve public safety by preventing weapons from getting into the hands uh, of those who should not have them under existing law. Uh, but there are broader, broader uh, aspects to this problem, as I talked about, and, and that's why we need to not look at it through uh, one single prism, but to examine uh, ways that we can help uh, address the problem through uh, assisting local law enforcement officials or uh, through the education system, the school system, uh, help keep kids off the street and, and uh, out of uh, gangs, for example. Um, and, and, you know, the President noted, and, and, and I, as I just uh, did as well, that, that um, it's not just a governmental problem. Uh, it's something that teachers, parents, neighborhoods, uh, and communities need to uh, talk about and take action on to make a difference in the lives of, uh, of, uh, of those who might otherwise fall into, a, uh, fall into violence. Jake. You used the word uh, giveaway, and President Obama in his statement yesterday used the word giveaway, uh, referring to the extension of the Bush, lower, the lower Bush tax cut rates for, uh, the, I guess, the top um, 1 or 2 percent of the country. People making over $200,000 a year, or couples making two fifty. dollars yeah. um, What do you say to a small business owner who says, that's not a giveaway, that's my money, and by the way, I'm going to need some of that money in order to help pay for the health care of individuals? that I'm now mandated to do. It's not giving anything away. It's allowing me to keep my money. Well, the phrasing of the question leaves out a few things, which is, one, uh, this tax cut uh, that the Senate passed uh, and that the President supports uh, would uh, go to 97 percent of small businesses in America, 97 percent. Further, this President has uh, cut the taxes of uh, small businesses in America 18 times, independent of this. So he's, his focus on assisting small businesses, which he considers the engine of economic growth in this country, the engine of job creation in this country, uh, has been intense and will continue to be. That is true. Well, no, but I mean, you, but your question framed it around the idea. So you're talking about the three percent here, and, and as we've noted, under the definition of small businesses that Republicans trot out when they're uh, insisting on these tax cuts for millionaires and billionaires. Uh, I wasn't means that about so I was but, talking but about somebody making over two hundred thousand dollars a year. Sure, but mean, again, that's ninety-seven percent people who file ta small businesses that file taxes uh, under the uh, individual uh, tax code uh, will receive this tax cut. Many I mean, the, 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 uh, uh, of the remaining, you know, self-described small businesses that we're talking about, we're talking about hedge fund managers often and and law firm partners, and addressing those small businesses uh, that. Uh, fall in the uh, remaining category, uh, this tax cut goes to everybody. This is a, 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 an often misunderstood fact in reporting and I think just in general that giving this tax cut, extending this tax cut to 98 percent of Americans, uh, those who make up to $250,000, means that everyone gets it, even those who make millions and billions, up to the 200, first $250,000 of income. So that for a family, that includes everyone, okay? Uh, and including small businesses that file uh, in this manner. Why Secondly, the president, the president believes that uh, small businesses are so important that he has dedicated a lot of uh, energy and focus on providing tax credits and tax incentives and tax cuts to small businesses uh, throughout his three and a half years in office. Beyond that, he believes that uh, extending the high-end Bush tax cuts 
again, is something we simply cannot afford. We, you know, we're talking about a uh, trillion dollars over a decade. Uh, we've seen what happened when these tax cuts, which you may recall, you and I were covering it, were sold initially as a payback from the budget surpluses that uh, were achieved under the Clinton administration. Uh, and then when the economy ran into trouble and uh, those surpluses were beginning to erode, uh, it was sold as an economic stimulus measure. And what we got was uh, middle class income stagnating, the slowest expansion uh, in 50 years, and an economic crisis the likes of which we haven't seen in uh, more than 70 years. So not, the question is just why is it a giveaway? Why are you guys using, you and the President of Obama, using the term giveaway when even if you support uh, the Senate Democrats' bill, it's not technically a giveaway. It is, a, it is allowing people to keep the tax cut that they got in 2001, 2002. Right, but it's, these are tax cuts that we cannot afford, that uh, do not, uh, by, as, by the estimates of credible, independent economists, do not measurably help the economy and do not, uh, in the way that tax cuts to uh, working and middle-class Americans help the economy. Uh, and, and, you know, we have to make choices. And it is a, it is, uh, a tax cut for the wealthiest Americans that we simply can't afford. And, and, the, and those who say that, oh, well, it, 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 you know, that it's terrible for the economy, remember, again, you and I were there and covered it. Uh, there were proclamations of gloom and doom of economic crisis and stagnation and uh, uh, recession that were promised by Republicans when President Clinton uh, instituted the tax rates that existed throughout the 90s. And instead of everything that Republicans predicted, we got the longest peacetime expansion, economic expansion in our history. We got 24 million jobs created. So, and plenty, as the President says, plenty of millionaires and billionaires uh, created as well. So uh, it's a matter, it's, 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 it's a matter of choices. I mean, that's what the, uh, I think the President makes clear. We can't afford this tax cut for the wealthiest Americans. It is a giveaway that we cannot afford. Middle class Americans uh, need that tax cut. Our economy needs it for 98 percent of the country. Right, I'll change the subject. The, the, when Vice President Biden issued a, a rather strong statement yesterday uh, about um, an unattributed quote or unattributed quotes from unnamed Romney advisors in a British newspaper, uh, the Romney campaign's response was that that um, Unattributed quotes <coughs> should not merit a response from the Vice President of the United States. And I, I wondered if you had any response to that. Well, I'll leave uh, specific campaign questions to the, uh, for the campaign to answer. I find it I, uh, a little ironic given uh, some of the uh, attention paid to uh, quotes from unnamed, alleged unnamed Obama campaign advisors that have uh, uh, been the uh, focus of attention on the, of the Romney campaign. Uh, what I can say is uh, that the record here is what matters. When this president came into office, our, uh, our uh, alliances were uh, under strain and frayed. Our standing in the world had been diminished. Uh, in the three and a half years that President Obama has been in office, he has strengthened our alliances around the world, including uh, and in particular with NATO countries, uh, and including and in particular with the United Kingdom, uh, with, with whom we have uh, a remarkably strong bond, a special relationship that has never been stronger. And, uh, and I'll leave the, the, the back and forth uh, to the campaign, but uh, let's, let's talk about uh, policy and fact here. Uh, and um, I, I would note that in that article in, in question, again, as a matter of policy, the only difference that I could tell, uh, aside from the, the quote that's gotten a lot of attention that was focused on was the need to, you know, the, the only difference in policy proposals that uh, seemed apparent were that uh, we should move a bus from one room to another in the White House, and that was uh, a principal policy difference, which is pretty preposterous. Uh, this, this president has strengthened our alliances. He has uh, uh, built up American credibility around the globe. He has kept his commitments to end the war in Iraq, uh, to take the fight to Al-Qaeda, to um, wind down our uh, war in Afghanistan, to rebalance and fo uh, our focus towards Asia, which was neglected in the eight years prior to President Obama coming into office. Uh, 
and he is meeting all those commitments. Thank you. Nora, congratulations. Thank you very much. Yes. I miss all of you. Um, <laughs> I will. Um, on Syria, um, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton talked about the opposition taking more and more territory that will eventually result in a safe haven inside of Syria. What is the Obama administration weighing in terms of additional support? Are there discussions ongoing about different, providing different sort of support to the opposition? Well, we're in conversations and discussions all the time uh, about Syria, both uh, internally and with our partners and allies around uh, the world at the United Nations, at the Friends of Syria and elsewhere. I don't have anything specific for you. Our, 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 our overall policy approach uh, is what it has been. Um, our focus is on continuing to pressure the Assad regime, continuing to draw attention to the need for uh, a peaceful transition, the uh, fact that the longer Assad is uh, in power, even as his grip on power diminishes, the more violent and chaotic the uh, situation in Syria becomes. Uh, and uh, you know, we'll continue to work with our partners to provide the assistance that we have been providing, humanitarian assistance, non-lethal assistance to the opposition, uh, uh, consultation with the uh, opposition as it forms itself. Um, and uh, this is all towards the goal of a transition uh, that guarantees fundamental rights in Syria uh, of all Syrians, including minorities. And uh, that is a critical element of any transition uh, in a situation like this, and it is a priority of the United States. There are many differences between Libya and Syria, which we talked about, but one of the things Libya had was safe havens for the opposition, and uh, the opposition held control of, of areas of Libya. When that becomes um, more clear, I mean, what the Secretary seemed to be hinting at is that the U.S. would then get further involved. Is that true? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by further involved, and we, we have not changed our position in terms of uh, providing arms to or engaging militarily in uh, Syria. Uh, you know, we are pursuing the policy that uh, we have been pursuing to pressure and isolate the Assad regime, to work with our allies and partners in the Friends of Syria, to continue to uh, try to build a consensus uh, internationally with the effort that we've undertaken at the United Nations and, and, and continue to point out to the Russians and others about the need uh, to accept that Assad uh, cannot remain in power in Syria uh, and that it is a mistake to uh, provide support to that regime uh, because in the end uh, the Syrian people will uh, remember whose side each country was on. Uh, in this uh, brutal conflict. So, uh, you know, these are the steps that we're taking. So I would not read uh, anything beyond that. I think she was noting the fact that the opposition has made gains uh, and that Assad's grip on his country uh, is diminishing. Ed. Two subjects. Uh, one being the National Security Leaks. Can you say flatly that nobody inside the White House was involved in the National Security Leaks that are being investigated? Well, Ed, as you know, this is a matter under investigation by two experienced federal prosecutors, so I'm not going to speak specifically about it. I can point you to the uh, statements of the President, uh, statements I've made in the past uh, about this, about the seriousness with which he takes this issue, uh, and, uh, and, and make the point that no one uh, relies on uh, the kind of information that is provided classified information that is provided to help him make uh, incredibly difficult decisions uh, than the President of the United States. And so he uh, has uh, no tolerance for right. leaks, and that's why uh, he has spoken to this issue in the way that he has. On Again, you're asking me to, to make a comment on an ongoing investigation. Right, but uh, you referenced past statements. One of your past statements was June 11th, and you said it was absurd when Senator McCain suggested that people inside the White House had leaked this information for political gain. Mm -hmm. In June, David Axelrod flatly said on ABC that nobody inside the White House was involved. And yesterday, David Axelrod was, hang on, sure. David Axelrod was on MSNBC yesterday and said the President did not leak anything. And then he followed up by saying the President did not authorize any leaks. That's different. For, you know, that leaves open the door that there were unauthorized leaks by White House people. So have you moved the goalposts? <laughs> No, Ed, I think you're uh, conflating a lot of things. I, all those statements are completely true. I stand by what I've said I, and, and what uh, Mr. Axelrod and the President has said. 
Uh, what I can tell you is that there are investigations ongoing, and I'm not going to comment on the specifics of the, of the investigations. I can point you to what the president said. said nobody in the White House was involved. Can you today say nobody in the White House was involved? Uh, in, involved in which particular case are you talking about? I can tell you that the president takes this very seriously. We all take this very seriously. It is, again, an insult and preposterous to suggest uh, that uh, this White House would leak information for political gain, classified information for political gain. That uh, did not happen and would not uh, happen under this president. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of this uh, began as a focus on uh, the operation that uh, successfully uh, removed Osama bin Laden from the battlefield. And, uh, you know, the fact of the matter is the president spoke to 100 million people about that operation. It, it, its existence uh, is well known. And uh, the This president, as that operation demonstrates, uh, finds uh, the use of the kinds of information that is protected uh, in our national security environment uh, highly important. He has to make life and death, death decisions uh, based on that information all the time, and he thinks it is extremely important that that information be safeguarded. One of Governor Romney's advisors yesterday, Richard Williamson, flat out accused the national security advisor, Tom Donnelly, of leaking information that David Sanger has written a book. Right, and he accused him. He made that accusation based on rumors he said he'd heard in the journalistic community. That same person called Russia the Soviet Union multiple occasions. He called Governor Romney, Governor Reagan on several occasions, and could not, uh, in my, in, that I could tell, uh, accurately or intelligently or coherently state a foreign policy oh. difference between uh, this president and, uh, and the governor. Um, so I would let the investigations take place. <laughs> uh, last topic, uh, Veterans Affairs. Uh, president to the VFW on Monday flatly said, your veterans' benefits will not be affected by the sequester. General Shinseki, Shinseki who is meeting with the President today, uh, testified on Capitol Hill yesterday, I believe, and said that administrative costs would be affected by um, the sequester, not veterans' benefits. question is, you know, if when you have the Veterans Secretary saying, that there will be some cuts to Veterans Affairs Department because of the sequester. You know, the President flatly saying your veterans' benefits won't be affected. How do you know that for sure when their budget's going to take a hit? Well, I would refer you to the uh, Secretary's comments that uh, if the sequester were to uh, come about and take, uh, take effect, that it would, again, I'm just citing what uh, Secretary Shinseki said, that the, 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 the uh, the impact would be on administrative costs in his agency. But let's, let's just back up and be clear. The whole point of the sequester was to uh, create a forcing mechanism to get Congress to act. And the sequester itself was filled with cuts to both defense and non-defense spending that were so onerous that nobody would support them. The President doesn't support them. Republicans and Democrats in Congress don't support them. Uh, and, and bipartisan majorities of both Republicans and Democrats uh, voted for this measure because they thought it was necessary to hold themselves accountable to get to do the right thing, which is to uh, pass a balanced deficit reduction plan. And as you know, Ed, that the only opposition to a balanced deficit reduction plan has come from Republicans who refuse to uh, accept the very mainstream principle that uh, we should not ask only the middle class and seniors uh, to bear the burden of uh, getting our fiscal house in order. I mean, you know, we have a situation where uh, defense cuts that the President believes are much too deep, uh, that Republicans and Democrats believe are much too deep, as well as non-defense cuts. Uh, uh, Republicans would allow those to go into place rather than ask millionaires and billionaires to pay a little bit more. Uh, that's unacceptable as far as this President's concerned. And every bipartisan commission that's looked at this issue has said that we need to take a balanced approach that includes uh, spending cuts, entitlement reforms, and revenues. Uh, some, you know, gatherings of senators, the gang of six and others, have, have, have also adopted that principle. That's the principle that uh, underlies the President's budget proposals. Uh, it's the principle behind uh, what the President submitted to the Super Committee last fall. That's the approach we have to take. It's a principle supported by a majority of the American people. 
Uh, unfortunately, there is this obstacle in Congress uh, that has prevented us from moving thus far. Uh, hopefully, that will uh, not be the case uh, as the year moves on. Yeah. Uh, on, you talked about the security briefing that the President got today about the Olympics. Does he often get security briefings about, I mean, does the United States have a role in the Olympic security? Well, we are absolutely, well, we have a very uh, close uh, relationship uh, with uh, the British, obviously, on security issues. This is a major international event where uh, many, many Americans will be present, as well as people from around the world. Uh, and we assist our allies uh, with uh, security uh, operations all the time. So in, in that sense, obviously, this is a British um, uh, an event ho hosted in London, uh, and, and uh, uh, the British are, are running this uh, security uh, operation. But uh, we are absolutely providing uh, assistance. What is, what, when you say we're providing assistance, what does that mean? Well, I mean, I, you know, beyond physical is it intelligence, is it actual uh, boots on the ground? What is it? We're, we're, we're providing uh, advice, consultation, cooperation. I don't have uh, specifics for you beyond that. Did the readout on this have anything to do today with what Mitt Romney told Brian Williams last night about security? <laughs> the president had this briefing today, so no, the answer is no. He did, it did not. The decision to read it out to us publicly. I'm just trying to fill you in on the president's day. Um, <laughs> on guns. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm just asking. You answered. Uh, you made a claim that he said that, you, that he has had a record uh, on gun control. What what is um, what is that? You were you were saying in the answer to Ben's question, you know about the things he has done during this administration on the issue of guns. What has he done? I know he signed a law expanding gun owner gun rights in national parks and stuff. What what is, so that people can carry concealed guns in the National Park. Well, I pointed what to the measures done? that have been taken at his direction by the Department of Justice to uh, enhance the quality uh, of our background checks uh, system that uh, reduces the likelihood that uh, weapons fall into the hands of criminals and others who should not have them under existing law. Uh, and that those are uh, actions that the uh, DOJ has deep. Can you explain it a little bit? Uh, you know, I don't have the paper on them. But we, when this became up uh, earlier uh, in the week, or rather late last week, I think uh, we had some that we passed out to you, and, and Department of Justice has it. Uh, but they've taken a number of measures to uh, increase the sort of uh, quality, both uh, the qu quantity of information and the depth of information uh, that uh, goes into the background check system. And, uh, you know, that has a that's progress, that's positive, it has a positive impact on uh, the goal of preventing uh, weapons that should not get into the hands of criminals under existing law from, uh, from getting to those criminals. Do you want Congress to vote on an assault weapon? He supports uh, and has, uh, uh, from the beginning, uh, the reinstatement of the assault weapons ban. I think you know very well that there's uh, a stalemate in Congress on that issue. Uh, as there is on so many issues. So it's still made on taxes. You guys put your shoulder in on that bill, and you said, no, we want to vote, we insist on a vote, we demand a vote, you brought leaders down. Mm -hmm. Fair to say not the same level of, of well, concern I, I, on this I, issue. I would say that um, the president supports it. Uh, he recognizes there's a stalemate in Congress. Uh, he believes that anything Congress were to do uh, must across the threshold of uh, uh, protecting the Second Amendment rights of, uh, of American citizens, law-abiding American citizens. Uh, and that uh, while there is that stalemate in Congress, there are, there are other things that we can do and we should do, and action that he's taken, uh, and, and, and action that we don't often talk about here, but uh, those who cover federal law enforcement uh, as well as education know about the programs that are in place to help local officials deal with violence in their communities uh, to help uh, connect teenagers with summer jobs, to help keep teenagers off the streets and out of gangs. And that's all part of a, of a broader effort to reduce violence. Let yes, sir. And then I'll move it around. Thank you. Just one on taxes. <coughs> you have said the president... Summer cup there, didn't you? Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the president has said, and you have said, that um, the wealthy don't need a tax cut right now. But then why still allow them to have a tax cut on the first $200,000, $250,000 of their income? Well, the, the principle is that 
everyone that, that we should reduce taxes uh, or f extend the tax cuts uh, for everyone earning, uh, every family earning $250,000 uh, or less. And I mean, you know how our tax code is written. That means that everybody making uh, up to that point uh, enjoys that tax cut. Uh, what the president does not believe is that we can afford extending the Bush high income tax cuts. They're too expensive. Uh, they're not uh, helpful to the economy. Uh, so, uh, and and uh, what we know from past experience is that uh, the uh, upper marginal rate that was in place under the administration, uh, the, the Clinton administration, uh, did not in any way impede economic growth. In fact, the tax rates that existed in the 1990s uh, were, uh, that were decried by Republicans at the time uh, were in place and were law when we had the uh, longest peacetime uh, economic expansion uh, in our history and when the economy created 24 million jobs. So that's why. And then I guess just to back up also, you've said many times how ruinous the Bush tax cuts were, then why still uh, extend 98%? Well, the president believes that the middle class uh, needs and deserves the assistance that this tax cut would provide, that we cannot raise taxes on the middle class by an average of $2,200 uh, next year. Uh, that is good for the individual families, and it's good for the economy. As economists, you know well, uh, because of the nature of your coverage, that independent economists uh, broadly agree that uh, the economic benefit of tax cuts is disproportionately felt when those tax cuts are given to lower and middle income Americans. That higher income Americans and millionaires and billionaires are much less likely to inject that money directly back into the economy. Uh, and, and therefore, it's even its uh, economic benefit, you know, setting aside the fairness argument, even the economic benefit uh, uh, is, uh, is minimal and, in and, and, and outweighed by the cost. Again, we're talking about a uh, trillion dollars over 10 years. And, and when you talk about the, you know, you, you mentioned the ruinous effects of the Bush tax cuts, the, those high-end tax cuts contributed mightily to the record trillion dollar plus deficit that President Obama inherited when he came into office. Uh, Mark, yeah, and I'll move to the back, Cheryl. Jay, on Ol Olympic security, was there some new or recent request from the British government for assistance? Uh, not that I'm aware of. This is uh, the, the kinds of, uh, partnership that we have uh, as a matter of course you know we have a long-standing close cooperation uh, cooperation relationship with UK officials on security and intelligence matters uh, US personnel in London uh, for the games are building on the well-established law enforcement and intelligence sharing operate uh, relationships that already exist between our two countries the State Department's Bureau of Diplomatic Security has the US security lead for Olympic Games in foreign countries and for more specifics I could refer you to them and one more on the tax cut. Doesn't it take two to have a stalemate? Isn't President Obama as dug in on his position as Republicans are on theirs? Oh, but that's where you, I'm so glad you asked that question because no, <laughs> no, everyone, and this is the miracle uh, of miracles, everyone in Washington, Republican and Democratic, uh, Republican and Democratic alike, in cap, uh, on Capitol Hill, in Congress, supports extension of the middle class tax cuts. So let's do it. Let's pass that and sign it into law. Uh, give that security to 98% of taxpaying Americans. Uh, give that uh, help to the economy that uh, that certainty will create. Uh, and then we can debate the merits of tax cuts for the top 2%, because that's where the disagreement is. Everyone agrees on tax cuts for 98%. Uh, why don't we get that done? Tax cuts for the 2%, we can, we can debate. Uh, and, and have a healthy debate about it. And, and, and obviously there are strong feelings on both sides of the issue. But we all agree that Americans earning up to $250,000, that's 98% of us, should get that tax cut extended. So let's do that. God, they could do a voice vote. They could pass it unanimously and send it down here and the president would sign it into law. So it's a one-sided stalemate. In this case, yes. I mean, look, I, look, there are real differences uh, between the parties. There are real differences, obviously, between the two uh, contenders uh, for the presidency. 
And as the President has made clear, here's an area where there is broad agreement. So let's act on it. <clears throat> we, will, we will continue to debate uh, whether or not we should take a balanced approach to uh, our, our fiscal challenges. We can continue to debate whether uh, we need to give tax cuts to the top 2 percent of income uh, earners in, in America. And we will debate a number of other issues, uh, the merits of uh, extending, you know, of, of health care reform and uh, Wall Street reform, for example. But, but here is something that we all agree on. Uh, and if, if we all agree on it, let's pass it. The President will sign it. And then we can debate the issues that uh, continue to divide us. Uh, you had a follow-up, John Christopher? Yeah. And then uh, Cheryl. Then it, well, we now know that uh, it's pretty obvious that uh, Governor and Mrs. Romney are attending the Olympics. Uh, they are there in London today. Uh, the question is, uh, we also know that First Lady Michelle Obama is leading the presidential delegation at the opening ceremonies. Does this mean there is a temporary bipartisan truce when it comes to supporting the USA teams? I think every uh, American supports uh, uh, our athletes, uh, whether they're uh, Republican, Democrat, Independent, or otherwise. Follow-up. Uh, has the President sent a special, special message along with the First Lady to the U.S. athletes? I believe there, uh, there is, uh, you know, a, a message that the President and First Lady uh, deliver to, uh, the First Lady will deliver, but a message from both the President and the First Lady. I don't have details on that for you now, but, but they're, uh, yeah, well, uh, we'll all be watching. Very exciting. Um, Cheryl and then April. Speaking of overwhelming, the House and Senate have overwhelmingly passed a bill to require the White House to reveal the details of the sequester cuts. Will the President sign that bill, and do you have that information already? Uh, the sequester transparency act. Well, the President will sign the bill. Uh, up to this point, OMB staff uh, has been conducting the analysis needed to move, and should it get to the point where it appears that Congress will not do its job and the sequester may take effect, OMB. DOD and the entire administration will be prepared. But let me be, let me be clear. Uh, there is no amount of planning or reporting that will turn the sequester into anything other than the devastating cut in defense and domestic investments that it was meant to be. The sequester was passed by both Republicans and Democrats, not as a policy we want to see enacted, but as a forcing mechanism to get Congress to act in a serious, balanced way on deficit reduction. As the President uh, himself has said, there's no reason why these cuts should happen. And Congress ought to be able to come together and agree on a balanced approach that reduces the deficit and keeps our military strong. Right now, as I uh, noted earlier in answer to Ed, congressional Republicans are trying to get out uh, of what they agreed to because they'd rather protect tax cuts for some of the wealthiest, wealthiest Americans uh, than make tough choices needed to reduce the deficit, uh, even if it risks big cuts in our military. The President disagrees and will continue to urge, urge Congress to act to avoid these devastating cuts. I think the answer is he will sign the bill. April. Okay, um, two questions. Uh, on the President's White House Initiative for Educational Excellence for <coughs> Americans, what is the budget for that? I understand that Arnie Duncan is holding the purse strings, and I ask that because uh, there is such an inequity in educational excellence or um, scoring between blacks and mainstream students. And to bridge that gap, it's going to take a lot of money from what many in the education fields have said. So how much money is this White House putting out for that? Well, I, again, I think you noted at the top that this is uh, something that will be uh, overseen by the Department of Education. So in terms of how it is funded, I would, return, I would refer you to them. I, I, look, the, 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 the executive order um, reflects the fact that the President has made providing a complete and competitive education for all Americans from cradle to career a top priority. And the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans will work across federal agencies and with partners and communities nationwide to produce a more effective continuum of education programs for African American students. The initiative aims to ensure that all African American students receive an education that fully prepares them for high school graduation, college completion, and productive careers. I would note, when you talk about funding, uh, that this is obviously not uh, this is a part of a broader effort uh, that uh, this president and his administration have embarked on to improve education in America. And when it comes to teachers in the classroom, uh, this is an issue that the president cares very deeply about. And that is why, in the American Jobs Act, he called on Congress to provide funding to put teachers back in the classroom uh, to prevent their 
layoffs around the country uh, that have occurred at state and local governmental levels that have affected teachers and policemen and firefighters uh, disproportionately, and, and especially in the education field. Congress has, Republicans in Congress have refused to pass that, but, but I mean, if, if Congress would act on that, on those elements of the American Jobs Act that, have, that they have yet to pass, not only would we benefit from what economists say would be another million jobs uh, for our economy, uh, but we, every child uh, in America who uh, is in a public school uh, could potentially benefit from having those teachers go back to, go back to work. And uh, you know, we call on Congress to act on that immediately. And my last question, please, on gun control. What does this administration, and you particularly say to Democrats, like Congressman Ed Towns of New York, who say there needs to be a serious uh, discussion with both sides across the aisle on the issue of gun control. He says that um, historically we've seen presidents killed by guns. We've seen urban areas people killed by guns. We've seen civil rights leaders killed by guns. We saw Gabriella Giffords shot. We've seen Columbine. We've seen Virginia Tech. And we just saw what happened uh, at the Midnight Massacre. What say you when Democrats are calling for this, and they're even in, in Congressman John Lewis, uh, right after a war, even evoked Robert Kennedy talking about, uh, are we tolerating violence and letting common humanity go? So what say you about that? Well, I, I, would, I would say what I have been saying uh, earlier in this briefing, which is that the President is focused on uh, steps that we can take to keep guns out of the hands of people who shouldn't have them under existing law. Uh, and because of those efforts, background checks are now more thorough and complete. Uh, there is a broader issue that your question raises about violence uh, in the country and in different areas of the country uh, that needs to be addressed uh, not just through legislation and certainly not narrowly just through uh, laws affecting guns, but uh, that has to do with uh, education and economic opportunity. It has to do with uh, assistance to local law enforcement and, and governmental officials in their efforts in their communities. Uh, it has to do with teachers and parents and, and neighborhoods uh, coming together to address this, uh, this problem. Uh, you know, it's not, as the President said last night, I mean, they, they, you, know, you have shocking events like the one that occurred in Aurora uh, or at Virginia Tech. Uh, but the fact is there, is, there, is uh, there are far too high levels of violence occurring uh, every day in the United States. Uh, and, and we need to take a comprehensive approach to that. Uh, and that's what the President is trying to do, recognizing that, uh, you know, in terms of legislation, you know, there are obstacles in Congress. And the President, you know, believes that we need to take measures that protect American Second Amendment rights uh, while ensuring that those who should not have weapons uh, uh, do not get them. Understanding this broad base about violence, but still with the incorporation of guns within this broad violence scope. If reelected, will this president push, actively push for the reinstatement of the assault weapons ban? You know, uh, I, I, I've stated the president's position on that. It has not changed. Uh, what I can tell you is the president will continue to push for common sense measures that make it harder for those who should not have guns under existing law from getting them uh, while protecting the Second Amendment rights of American citizens. Uh, Do you think it's appropriate for Governor Romney to attend this fundraiser in London tonight it's being co-hosted by a lobbyist from Barclays? Seeing as Barclays is at the center of this LIBOR scandal, the Barclays CEO <coughs> pulled out of this fundraiser, but still there's, there's going to be a presence there from Barclays at mm -hmm. this fundraiser tonight. I think that is uh, definitely a question that I would refer to the campaign. What about the amount of money that's being spent abroad, raised abroad? I mean, the president's raised over $600,000 at fundraisers in other countries. I mean, to most Americans, I think, would be surprised to hear that. Would you have but these are, these, this is money raised uh, from Americans. Shanghai and other, in London and other yeah, I, I think the, I, I, I would refer you to probably both campaigns, but on the, on, in terms of, uh, that, but I, I know that uh, we follow the rules in terms of uh, fundraising. And, and on the other issue that you began with, I would refer you to, uh, to the reelection campaign. Yes. What city does the 
this administration considered to be the capital of Israel, Jerusalem or Tel Aviv? Uh, <laughs> um, I haven't had that question in a while. Our position has not changed, Connie. Can we? Uh, What's the capital? Our, you know our position. I don't. Chris, I don't no, no. She Connie, doesn't know. Don't she doesn't know. That's why she asked. <laughs> she does know. I don't. She does not know. She just said she doesn't know. We have, we have, I don't we have know. Long, come on, let's, I call on Christy. Go ahead. The question of gun violence. Why did the president wait? What's the reason for the venue and the timing of those? The, the remarks last night, well, it was a very appropriate venue. It was the Urban League Conference. He talked about uh, a number of issues, especially the economy, uh, and uh, as well as uh, the problem of, of violence in urban communities. But those were his most extensive and impassioned remarks, and I just wondered if he's planning to do that in a more noticeable venue at a more noticeable time. You mean a speech in front of a vast audience with television cameras is not is not uh, more noticeable. Late night, it was five days later. Well, we don't. We, we didn't schedule. You know, we don't. Uh, we didn't organize the, the conference. It was a very appropriate place to, uh, to to have that uh, to have that conversation. Okay. Tel Aviv or Jerusalem? Yeah. You know the answer. Uh, yeah. Don't know the answer. We uh, don't know the answer. Uh, Could you just give us an answer? What do you recognize? What does it do? Uh, our, our position hasn't changed, Lester. Can I, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, uh, India has a now new president. If president has spoken to him, and second, uh, I don't have any readouts of uh, foreign leader calls. Uh, uh, recently, Time magazine has come up uh, for the Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh, that he is an underachiever and also shadow president, shadow prime minister. What does the President think of, of the India's Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, you know, his relationship with him? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll have to, uh, I haven't had that conversation with him. I mean, we have a very important relationship with India, Goyal, as you know, uh, but I haven't had that conversation and with him finally, lately. Uh, as AIDS, International AIDS Conference going on in Washington, and thousands of people around the globe are here, and what message do you think the President has as far as spreading AIDS around the globe, but AIDS has gone down here in this country, but spreading uh, uh, in other Well, countries. the President's commitment to fighting AIDS, uh, both globally and domestically, I think has been demonstrated. Uh, we gave out a lot of information uh, in advance of this conference, uh, had some senior officials speaking at the conference, so the commitment is, is uh, broad-based. Thank Thanks, Ben. Thanks.